Thank you, Gina, for that wonderful talk. Um, uh, Janet introduced me, so I'm going to restate my name just in case you forgot who I am. Uh, I'm Darakshan Mir, and I'm a fellow here at Data and Society. I would like to start off by thanking um, all the people here at Data and Society and all of the visitors here who've come to my talk. But in particular, I want to thank the staff, the researchers, the fellows, every person who walked into this space and taught me something every single time I came in here and supported me. I'm deeply, deeply grateful for having been part of this community for the last 10 months. Um, and I'm really looking forward to all the collaborations I've formed here and taking them forward. Um, so I'm going to start off by constructing a question for us. And hopefully, uh, I think there is hope even in the construction of this question. So here is a community of people living their lives. And in the process of living their lives in the modern world, they are inextricably generating data. Others have called uh, people living in this modern day uh, data bodies. So you can think about these communities uh, as communities of data bodies. So perhaps the, this community of people, they live in a smart city, and they don't even know it. Perhaps uh, they use uh, mobile health devices or more commonly known as wearables, such as Fitbits and other things. And in the process, they generate data. And here's the question I want to ask. Why don't we live in a world where a community can come together and decide that it is acceptable for our location data to be used to, say, um, study the uh, spread of malaria or Ebola in our community, or that it is acceptable for our wearable health data to be used to study the social and uh, environmental factors that promote or prevent cancer, but that it is unaccept unacceptable for this health data to be used to sell me a product or to track me arbitrarily across the um, mobile ecosystem. Instead, if you were here for fellow Rishabh Nityanand's talk, you know that there is a booming market for cross-platform tracking across the mobile ecosystem. So more generally, the question I'm constructing is, why doesn't this notion of privacy from the bottom up even exist? Okay. And there are a host of complex political, economic, and social reasons for this. But the question I want to ask is, and the, what I'm specifically interested in, is the practice that computer scientists can adopt, where we can even begin to imagine an architecture of privacy that puts, pri that puts consent at, this, at the front and center uh, in this manner, and, lets, um, and lets, lets computer scientists decide and think about the larger political, social, and economic context in which we build technologies. And one such context is that of power. So you can see power is in red here, and it's an important concept that I'm going to return to a little later. Uh, but before I uh, talk more about power, I want to give you a sense of the landscape in computer science research that I come from. Um, so in the sub-discipline of computer science that I come from, there is typically an, an assumption that there is inherent value or common good uh, in the existence of uh, personal data around us. For example, the existence of location data can help us create empirical models of how communicable diseases spread around with human travel. Okay. And second, that the utilization of this data, ostensibly for the common good, um, often comes in conflict with privacy, and that could hinder scientific progress. So the interest in privacy comes from the perspective of preserving the potential of common good in data. Okay. So therefore, what ends up happening is in this kind of framing, it becomes a struggle between privacy and utility, which by the way, we quantify both of those notions, and then it becomes a balance between, an analysis of balance between these two notions. Okay, so remember I told you power is going to be really important in here? So the question is, where is power? Um, and I want to argue that power hides but very decidedly operates behind this, these concept and in this framing. Okay? Uh, the framing of this privacy utility 
struggle, in the words of cryptographer and computer scientist Philip Rogaway, rearranges power. And I want to make the argument that if we don't think about the power underlying this privacy utility framework more carefully, we are more likely to empower the already powerful at the expense uh, of the disempowered. All right, so I'm going to re-examine the privacy utility framing I showed you earlier and re-examine it from, from this perspective of, uh, of how, it, how uh, power is rearranged in that framing. So um, we're going to re-examine uh, the notion of utility and privacy. All right, um, so let's look at utility. Now, certainly all kinds of data sets do not enhance the common good. For example, you might say that location data that helps us construct empirical models of how diseases spread enhances the common good. Uh, but this kind of location data is, also has the potential of being used for, say, location-based advertising. And when you serve advertisements using location data, you can also use that location to politically profile people, okay? as was done in 2014 in Ukraine, where when protesters were out there in the public sphere protesting, uh, they received a rather chilling message on their cell phones saying, dear subscriber, you're registered as a participant in a mass disturbance. So there is an existing political context here in which this data is being used against uh, the vulnerable when they are trying to organize. Uh, moreover, all kinds of data sets that enhance the common good do not exist. So for example, um, there is the non-existence of this data set of the, of the number of, of the people who have been killed by uh, police in the United States. Uh, the non-existence of this data set serves the more powerful by eluding accountability. Okay? So when, when you just use the concept of utility, unless you examine the question of utility for whom and for what, uh, we are hiding these notions of power behind these kinds of concepts. So now I want to examine this notion of privacy from this perspective of power again. Uh, the privacy is not a uni or the lack of it is not uniformly experienced. Uh, so for example, in the higher education sphere, there are websites that gather information about potential students and then sell that data to for-profit colleges. The for-profit uh, college industry is known to target low-income students and it is also uh, known to leave students with uh, more higher debts and uh, fewer job prospects. So there is an existing socioeconomic context for privacy here. Okay, so um, now if we think about privacy once again, and think about how can our conceptualizations of privacy, uh, if, if we commit to a notion of, uh, if we commit to a value of empowering not the powerful, but tilt the balance in favor of the disempowered, how do our conceptualizations of privacy change? Okay. Um, so what, what are empowering values? One articulation of an empowering value that I find convincing is that of privacy as a public good. So privacy as a public good challenges the notion that uh, my privacy is mine alone and your privacy is yours alone, and instead posits that our privacy is inextricably linked. That the data that a person produces concerns both herself and others. So for example, just by sharing a particular zip code where say two low-income students reside, both of them are far more vulnerable to being targeted by for-profit college, uh, colleges. Therefore, it is in the interest of communities to get together and protect their privacy. So Fairfield and Engel, among others, articulate this uh, notion of privacy for a public good and make the case that groups must be given tools to create the public good of privacy and resist the public bad of readily available intrusive information. And when they use the word tools, they mean legal and regulatory tools. The direction I want to take this in is thinking about what kinds of technical tools can support uh, empowering groups to create the public good of uh, privacy. 
And so this brings us back to the notion of privacy from the bottom up, right? where communities can come together and decide that in a particular technological context, this is what's acceptable and this is what is unacceptable. Okay. Now, what is, what is entailed in capturing these kinds of privacy rules? How do we implement such a system? Um, so implementing such a system or creating such a system involves uh, both social and technical processes. So you would first need to come up with a social process whereby communities could create or elicit these kinds of rules in particular technological contexts. These could be participatory processes, these could be other processes. And then you would create a technical system that would be capable of capturing these kinds of privacy rules and enforcing them on all kinds of information flows. Okay. In other words, it would be a community-based privacy governance system. Um, and so uh, what we did, what I did this past year was that with um, researcher Mark Latanero here at Data and Society, uh, Jan Schwarzneider, who's standing back there, who I met at Data and Society, who's at NYU. We created a framework for such a community-based uh, uh, privacy governance system. We laid out a framework for it. Uh, and we presented some of this work at a couple of places, a privacy engineering workshop, uh, and it was also workshop at the Privacy Law Scholars Conference. Uh, and now, uh, in addition to this, to this team of people, we also have my colleagues back at Bucknell, Evan Peck and Jennifer Silva. Um, Jennifer Silva is a sociologist of inequality. And what we are doing with this team is we are creating a social, social technical system, both social processes and technical systems, uh, whose purpose is to really illustrate both the social processes and the technical possibilities of of what is entailed in creating an end-to-end -end privacy governance system, so that the goal is to empower communities. And so bringing, uh, wrapping it back to um, the end of my fellowship year and the return of my educator part of me, uh, returning to Bucknell, I have students who are currently teasing out the social process part of it. So this is a team of students who's kind of already working on this process. But I want to return uh, back and leave you with, with this question. I want to highlight this question of community-based public governance. I understand it's a really complicated question. And it has several complex pieces to this entire picture. And constructing a proof of concept system or a prototype of a system um, that uh, a prototype of a privacy governance system is, from my perspective, an exercise in testing the possibilities, both socially and technically. But this is not, it's far from a technology-only question. It's a really, really complex question. So I'll leave you with this question. How do you support a democratic, uh, community-based public governance of privacy? Uh, I invite you to help me figure out how to answer it, or even figure out if it's the right question to ask and what other questions we should be asking. Thank you.